Okay, cool. So real quick, uh, if anybody has a laptop out right now, you guys should copy that fingerprint down and sign it because we need signatures on the release key for secure drop. So hooray bonus points if you can sign that by the end of the talk. So um, yeah, I'm one of the maintainers of secure drop and this talk is going to be discussing how we improve secure drops security architecture and the focus is going to be on explaining it in a way that would allow you to apply some of these other things to other projects and not just, you know, laser focusing on the particular issues we face that maybe nobody else faces. So the very high level, actually hands up if you know what secure drop is. Okay, a few people. Okay, so for those who don't, the high level is secure drop is an open source whistleblower submission system that media organizations can use to securely accept documents from and communicate with anonymous sources. And this is something that we would stick in the newsroom of uh, news organizations to allow them to uh, keep their sources anonymous because do things like just not say the name of our source we could say we don't know and just you know deny it until we get left alone but you know we have the problem now of global mass surveillance where they like to say nothing is beyond our reach but and to some extent that is true they can watch the networks they can watch phone communications and whatnot so in order to restore the capability of news organizations journalists to be able to keep their source anonymous we need technological solutions until we can you know get all those government organizations back in check. Um, right now it's deployed with a bunch of major news organizations. This is a handful, there's a whole bunch more, but that's not what this talk is about. So our threat model is explicitly groups like NSA, GHCQ, and the rest of the five eyes. We assume that the kind of people who would want to be submitting things to secure drop are the kind of people who would be actively target targeted by intelligence agencies or local governments and whatnot, so we have a very paranoid threat model we work with. Um, the two main things we're trying to protect, specifically number one is source anonymity. That's the number one thing that we would like to retain secret at the end of the day. And the second one, which is very closely related, is document confidentiality. So if somebody gets the documents, the source leaks, they could use those to de-anonymize de them even if the source is communicating over Tor. So these two things are really what we focus on during development. Um, and the question again, who do I protect it from? Well, in reality, it's actually everyone, but really nation states, corporations, and local law enforcement. And we know that these kind of groups are actively targeting journalists. You can see press freedom violations around the world. Um, there's actually a press freedom tracker that does track some of these things. So we do know that this is happening all over all the time. And if we know those are the people who are the threat actors when we're developing this, we say, okay, well, what can these people do? Actually, it's kind of can do a lot of stuff, but really intercepting network traffic is a huge one. If somebody can watch network traffic, they can see, you know, 800 megabytes of files move, and then there's an 800 file, megabyte file sitting on the server. We can kind of correlate that and say that was a lot of Tor traffic. We have a good idea who that probably was. They can maybe hack into the servers, maybe not, but it's a good chance that in a very long run, somebody may hack into one of the servers. And we also see things where they will send, send agents to physically seize hardware. And in this context, we, what we do not protect against is where somebody breaks into the office, sticks in a bad USB and malwares. We're talking about an agent as part of um, like a subpoena, picking up the server and just taking the server and running off with it. And this could include uh, doing cold boot attacks where they've, you know, drop the memory into something cold and then reboot it later and read the memory out. So we do care about server's memory being pretty clean. And the last one we, that we work on a lot is people submitting malware to users of SecureDrop through SecureDrop itself because of course they're gonna open the document on one of the workstations and it's kind of guaranteed. Phishing emails, you know, maybe not gonna open it. It might look suspicious, but somebody says, hey, I have this, you know, great PDF about, you know, some illegal operation, you're going to open it. Um, okay, so another thing with this complicated threat model is it is infinitely complex. Like, we could just go down any one rabbit hole f until our eyes bleed. We could talk about any one little thing forever, and we're going to try to focus today on just a few of the bigger changes we made lately and some of the bigger screw-ups. 
Um, so the current state of things is we have one application server that runs um, all of our code that is mostly what SecureDrop is. And that is a GR security patch kernel to help minimize the types of attacks you can do using memory corruption. Um, we run a Python application. We store our data in a very small SQLite database. And we run all this behind uh, Apache. And on top of the application server, we have uh, a firewall that blocks all inbound traffic. So this server is only accessible through its outbound connections through Tor hidden services, including for administration and for sources and journalists using it. Um, this again is monitored by a monitor server using OSSEC to try and look for intrusions. Um, and lastly, this is connected to sources and journalists both connected all this through Tor in roughly the same way. And then a journalist will retrieve documents from the journalist interface and take them off to an air-gapped laptop to decrypt them. So that's basically how it works. Um, our development is actually very simple. We write a feature, we write tests, we write unit tests, we do functional tests with Selenium, we write multi-stage tests to test deployment and provisioning with Molecule, we write a bunch of documentation to help uh, sources and admins and journalists and developers. We do mandatory code reviews for everything that gets merged by at least two members of the team, so the person submitting it and the person signing off on it. We automate testing, we do linting. This is all pretty normal stuff for development. So this, this isn't actually that special of a thing that SecureDrop does. But what's interesting is that like, at every step, we actually put like, a lot of effort into all these things that we know that we can run end to end a complete submission set through the browser at, like, at every single pull request, at every single check-in. And we you know, do have to have some automated testing or manual testing because we're using a bunch of different USBs plugged into a bunch of physical hardware. But in the end, this isn't that interesting of, de of a development process. But what we're trying to do is keep each of those things um, like as high functioning of a level as possible during the whole development. That said, it's kind of like fighting little fires all the time. So, you know, we as software developers, you get, there's an update to something on the operating system and now you have to patch it because, okay, cool, this, this library is no longer compatible with this library or the operating system becomes EOL'd and every couple of years you have to re change your operating system. So that, that slide before about our development process, like keeping that so that it's very easy to go through the entire process each time really helps us with actually developing secure features because we're not getting bogged down saying, okay, we had to update one Python library and we spent nine hours debugging what broke. No, we try to really say like that library change should be quick. We just push off the CI and half an hour later we get a green light or a red light if that feature worked or not. So, uh, you know, I forgot what I was going with this slide. There's something about like things break, but I don't remember where I was going. Pretend the poop emoji is not there, but things do break. And so since this talk is about improving the architecture, this is, we're going to actually focus on the things that haven't gone well in hopes that this might help you guys in future projects not make some of the design decisions or mistakes that we've made in the past. So um, one of them was, this is a tweet from Kevin Polson, and over the summer or early fall, uh, he got a submission to SecureDrop that when he untarred it, it turned into a desktop file. Nautilus executed the desktop file. The desktop file ran arbitrary Python, scraped the GPG keys and then posted a signed message back to some server somewhere. And he posted this to Twitter, that which is how we all found out about it. And we had to then go through and figure out what happened. And so really the root cause was that Nautilus allows an executable file with the, uh, or allows a file with the executable bit set to run any arbitrary code. And this allowed the attacker to run Python that scrapes the keys, put them in a, in a document with a QR code, and that QR code, when somebody scanned it, pinged the, end, uh, the server with the data from the air gap. And so this is a very complicated attack, but this does happen. And so what really went wrong, though, is that the secure viewing station isn't a true air gap. We're allowing people to you know, move USBs off of it and move data off of it. So we do know that at some point data will be leaving it. But we you know, didn't tell journalists, you know, by the way, uh, be very careful about what you're taking off of it because it, that actually might be a trick. It's, you know, that's roughly equally the hard, uh, as hard of a problem as telling people not to get fish. Like if anybody here is a security person, no? 
okay, well, your users are going to get fished all the time if you work for a big co company, and there's basically nothing you can do to realistically train every user to not be fished. Like, it's inevitable. And so in that case, like, training users not to scan certain QR codes, like, it's just a losing battle. And so um, this kind of the issue we have with this is imperfect isolation. So we allowed arbitrary code to execute in the same environment that contained all of our GPG keys. And so, like, um, the future development of this would be finding a way to uh, sandbox the decryption code and the like viewing of document code from where the actual like keys are stored. And like this is something we've kind of known that the that workstation doesn't have amazing isolation. It's pretty good, and we it's hard to get information off it, but stuff does happen. Um, so. Like if this is the current workflow where you have like the source connects via Tor to secure drop, the journalist connects to Tor again or connects to secure drop via Tor, and then moves these USB sticks around. It's a, it's a lot of manual work and it's a little bit frustrating to work with if you're constantly having to like you know move encrypted USBs back and forth between devices. So our future design decision that we think will decrease uh, like the manual processes that journalists and admins could make mistakes on and also increase the isolation of our system is moving to cubes to have the decryption and the document viewing and the keys all stored in separate systems so that we are not running the risk of random malware files executing in the same VM as the actual decryption keys. Um, so this was brought up earlier in another presentation, but loosely like this would be sort of the workflow so that when the journalist connects, they would connect through Hunix to have like their nice Tor circuit to get out to the um, secure drop application server, pull the stuff down, and then each document would be opened in a disposable VM. We could then clean the documents and say, okay, this PDF has really just been rendered to a whole bunch of screenshots, which means we can go forward and hand these, these PDFs out to the entire rest of the company and know that we didn't just either like malware the whole company or pull information off of the air gap. So this is, we were trying to keep things clean so that when documents do leave, the secure drop area of a uh, news organization, we're not giving infected files to the entire trusted internal network of the company. Um, so another thing that went a little bit wrong is uh, Tor did made an update, and this thing that went wrong was not Tor's fault; it was our fault. We were running a custom um, app armor set of rules against Tor, uh, the Tor binaries and Tor file system like files. And when they shipped this, it broke the app armor rules and it knocked every single secure drop off of the network simultaneously because they all updated to new Tor and we got kicked off. So to update app armor rules and push those out to everybody to fix this. And so that's one of the things is that we have a lot of dependencies and every system has a lot of dependencies. And the more you can control your dependencies, the less likely something will move under your feet and break part of your system. And what we've done to fix this actually is we no longer use upstream Tor directly. We actually mirror the entire Tor repository to a local Freedom the Press Foundation controlled secure uh, app repository. And then we, we point our uh, secure drop servers to this new Tor um, mirror. And actually, Connor in the back over there is the one who I believe did all this. Am I right? Yeah? Yeah. So Connor implemented this, and this pull request Again, like let's just now have a little bit more control over our system so that external factors like uh, or external dependencies changing still have to go through QA so that we know that we can go end to end on the system. We can provision systems. We know that the entire process still works before we push this out to some 60 news organizations around the world. Um, the next major usability thing uh, like for security that we did is at, is like a UX improvement, which was we translated secure drop into a whole bunch of different languages. And this there's right now this is just a handful. There's a lot more done and this is up on the web and we're actively working on translating more and more of secure drop. And this is actually it might not sound like a secure architecture thing, but from the sense that like the system as a whole does rely a lot on administrators and journalists and sources doing correct behavior at every step along the way. Like this helps sources you know, if we tell them, memorize your password, don't share your password, like only connect with Tor browser, 
if they're doing that in a language they don't really know, which was only English for the longest time, it increases the chances that they're going to make a mistake. And in a sense, because we are the stewards of this project, it's on us to ensure that their behavior like, is nudged along in the correct direction by a good user experience. So like, people like to talk about like, the coolest encryption algorithms they use. Like, for us, if we say, like, if we tell them, you know, do X, and they can't do that one X thing, they immediately de-anonymize themselves, that's, like, that's not any good if we use the sweetest, latest crypto. So making these good UX changes also does imp impact um, the design and turn of the program. Like, there's little small things. Like, every time we have a string, we have to rethink about how we actually assemble these strings because, you know, you can't just drop random nouns at the end of a sentence because in some other languages, you know, you have, like, inflection, declination, and whatnot. And so, like, this is only a small example, but, like, going through the code, there were a whole bunch of places where we did things, like, pluralize things by string concatenation by adding just plus S to the end. And that doesn't really work when you're internationalizing. So, on top of that, there was um, a whole bunch of ch uh, changes we had to make to the development process, and one of them was uh, developing a workflow that allows us to like, submit all these strings out to somewhere where we can then solicit translations from the community, building these back in the application, and then also knowing that any feature that requires a string change would have to go through um, a longer process or have a, like, a longer timetable because we do require outside contributors to do these, especially as the number of languages grow. So, you know, making a quick patch into um, a release to quickly get something out sometimes can't happen anymore. So we try to think about how we're going to develop in a way that gets these fixes in and, and allows people to ship things out um, without, you know, constantly saying, oh, we broke a string, we broke a string, we broke a string, and then, you know, bothering the community. Um, Another thing on the UX side is this is the old landing page, and it's a little hard to read at the top in this font, but it says, we recommend using Tor Browser to access TeardDrop, learn how to install it, or ignore this warning to continue. And this warning is flashed uh, via CSS if the, or no, via the user agent um, in the HTML when somebody like, hits the page for the first time. And so we did some user testing, and I say we as in the engineers, which is to say we are probably not qualified to be doing user testing. Um, and they said, oh, that sounds scary, like I did something wrong. I'm just visiting this for the first time. So after a little bit of talking to some people, we switched this to being purple. Say, okay, purple is a less scary color. Now when users see this, they won't think they did something wrong. And then the downside was immediately I'm to ignore this because it looks it's just part of the design. It looks like a purple banner, and nobody listened to this anymore, which again says, we're engineers. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. We should go out, and we should find people who are experts in the field of user experience and user, inter uh, user interfaces and have them really do an audit of the app to say, okay, like us as engineers, we think we had this nice, secure pattern, but do we? Like, what are the hidden things that are going wrong? Like, you know, maybe these, this text looks pretty normal to us, but to the average user, it it's, you know, turns them away and encourages them to do bad behavior. So, again, secure architecture might mean a lot of things, but it also does include, like, the user experience side of this. Um, another related architecture thing was... We had at least one dedicated admin who would then get emails every time there was an OS, OS sec alert. And they were getting fatigued by this. And to, we, I mean, we don't know exactly how they were, but we know that there was a complaint that there's too many emails. And if somebody's getting an email every 30 minutes that says, like, oh, app updated something, oh, this happened, oh, that happened, and none of it is actionable from a security perspective, we're going to wear them down so that the day that there actually is an intrusion, they just delete it with their other things. Or they set up a filter so that, you know, they have this one inbox with 10,000 unread OSSEC messages. They're going to miss it. And so we had to go through and really work on our rules for OSSEC to just say, okay, cool, this is not necessary to alert. We should try to avoid this. And we're trying to shrink this down as a team so that the people out in the field who are doing the day-to-day -day operations of SecureDrop aren't being overburdened and then, you know, being incapacitated in their ability to be effective admins. Um, so those are some things we've worked on in just like the, the past, I don't know, eight months or so. 
um, and still working on some of these things right now. But one of the big changes of the future is moving away from SQLite to Postgres. So this kind of falls under the principle of least privilege. We have applications that are, when they interact with SQLite, they can just do anything to it. That means the source interface can read journalist passwords and usernames, which is there's no reason it needs to do that. And that's a limitation of SQLite right now. So we have to, we're gonna move to a bigger database that um, has better access controls. And it would also be interesting in the future because if we do want to do something like make SecureOp highly available, we say we have three application servers that all sit behind Onion Balance, they would need to share a database and you don't want to do that on a file system. So you would then want Postgres available via um, TCP sitting behind the firewall and then you can have many application servers interacting with one database server. Um, oh, that slide is not done. Anyways. So two of the major things we've done um, recently were we also had to, to get to the point where we could even add Postgres. We then first had to add Alembic, which is the Python library and command line tool for applying um, database migrations. And before we could do that, we also depended on um, Flask SQL Alchemy, which was not implemented in the original Flask application. We also have to do a, a pretty large refactor of our tests. And before we could even do either of those two things, we had also do a large refactor of the source and journal applications. And so like, even to make this one change of preventing the um, source application from being able to read the data for maybe like the password hashes and um, usernames of journalists, like it's like many steps to get away from this. And so it's not actually terribly interesting of a task. Like this is what I do day to day and it's actually quite boring, but like that's a really important thing with secure software is there's just like tons and tons and tons of tedious work you need to do like every step along the way to have like a well formatted application that's well mo like is modular that allows you to make updates that allows you to you know quickly add tests and verify that the behavior is correct so like it's not a, this isn't a fun presentation slide it's just there's crappy work you have to do to make secure software sometimes and that's kind of part of being an engineer like uh, talking to Connor last night about this, and his uh, analogy was that, you know, a big old skyscraper is really cool. It's pouring concrete, and pouring concrete is a pretty boring task. So like us as software developers need to do more concrete pouring. Um, another hopefully improvement is right now we have started to dockerize the development environment to make it a little bit easier to, for everybody to set things up, which isn't strictly a security fix at the moment, but we're potentially moving from the current app server design, which is just everything piled onto the application server and running all in the same user space, into, um, this, is, this is also up for debate, so anybody on the team who doesn't like this idea, you know, you can yell at me later, but this is something we're considering doing, which is, um, splitting off the different parts of the applications into their own containers and then restricting who can talk to what. And so the source application doesn't actually need to talk to the internet ever. It just needs to listen on or make itself available to Nginx or the source application also doesn't have any reason to need to talk to even be able to like hit the IP addresses of the Postgres database. And so by kind of removing things, we get the, the benefit of like separation of responsibilities, but also we know that in the containers, we can be a little bit more creative with the dependencies that we need across the different ones and not worry about system dependency collisions or things pinning versions and holding us back from updates we need because of, you know, locked dependencies. And it's not always, it's not a huge issue, but it is a consideration that we can then control a little bit more how each of the different pieces fit together. Um, and on top of those few advancements that we're looking at, which are not massive, but somewhat big, um, one thing that came up this summer or fall was there was a research paper about fingerprinting onion services, which was looking at um, if you sit between the like user and the guard node or you are a bad guard node and you watch Tor traffic go in and you say, okay, cool, I can see an encrypted stream coming in. Can I guess what onion service that is? And can I guess what they were doing? And it turns out that yes, you can in a lot of cases use, because there's not that many, um, Onion services out there in the world, and there's not that many that get a lot of traffic. So, if you're trying to make a guess who's using, oh, time's up. What? Okay. Anyways, this is something that is an interesting research question, but we don't have enough bandwidth 
to be able to effectively deploy mitigations against this because we'd have to write mitigations, then test them and verify that you can't fingerprint secure drop um, as an onion service after these have been applied. So if anybody is a machine learning expert and wants to help us, or if any of these people in the audience, you know, come talk to us afterwards and we'll have a chat. Um, I guess maybe time for one or two questions. Um, cool, yeah, this is, take a picture of this if you want to come join us, and yeah. Yeah, so when uh, FPF for a long time was kind of, oh yeah, so the question was, do we see different threats across different languages and across different regions? And for a long time, one of the, the print things on Secure Drop was that it w was assumed that people would know, like the NSA would know that some news organization has Secure Drop running in their office at this location, and we were relying on the US legal system to protect the servers. But running, say, Secure Drop in a country with a hostile government might be different. So like in that sense, like using Tor becomes more risky, like then you want maybe your onion services to actually be more anonymous and the threat model does change as you move from around different or news organizations around the world. Okay. Is, do we have what time is it? Do, do we have time for more questions? Question here? Right, do, maybe one more question. No. Anybody else? Can you show again the oh. GPG key? Yeah, so, oh yeah, that's actually a good one. So this is the GPG key at the beginning. If anybody could take a picture, oh my God, so many animations. Whew. Cool, this one, if you guys could sign that one, that would help us uh, ensure the integrity of this. Admins use that when they install Secure Drop. So if you want to help admins correctly verify that they have the real authentic Secure Drop software, signing this would help us. Um, one more question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask how many languages have you got your documentation <coughs> in at the moment? The documentation is only in English because it's pretty extensive and we don't have a plan at the moment to implement that. We have only implemented the documentation on the source and journalist interfaces. The translation? Uh, yes, yeah. So I, I mean, you can talk to us after that. That one's a complicated question because we don't know. This, this internationalization thing, which is actually the work of Loic over here, who's did pretty much all of, Yeah, but she asked about um, the documentation. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not the documentation, it's the application, translation, seven languages. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, do we have more time? Maybe, who, is the next presenter here? The next presenter is not here. Maybe more questions. <laughs> cool. Um, in the gray? Okay, uh, pardon me, English. I just wanted to know if you have planned to integrate um, like provider to avoid stenographic attack. Like when a source is publishing a PDF document, maybe there are hidden uh, fingerprints in it and... Yeah, so I think, I know there's some things like Tails comes with the metadata anonymization tool, which will strip out some metadata. But if you do something like, you know, you have like printer dots or there's like some way that uh, images were subtly manipulated when they download them from a server with like a very small watermark on them. Mm -hmm. Like we don't know about that. So that would fall more under the training of journalists about how to redact information or release documents selectively and how to you know, assess that themselves. It kind of it falls a little bit outside the scope of the secure drop software, but it is relevant and I don't have the best answer for that one. <coughs> is the next presenter here for the next talk? Okay, yeah, I guess just rotate. Cool. Thanks, everyone.